Hey everybody, uh, it's Joe and Celia Wallace from South LA Cafe and Market. We are so excited to be together again um, with our rep from our council district eight here in South Central LA. This is Marquise Harris Dawson. Say hello to the folks. Hello folks, uh, it's good to be here with uh, team Celia and Joe and the South LA Cafe family. Awesome. So you look, you look pretty casual there. Where are you at right now? I am uh, in what used to be my music room and studio, which is now my uh, office since uh, we've been uh, working from home. Uh, got a little studio set up in here. I still get to play music occasionally, but it's the music's being overrun by uh, everyday business. <laughs> I know the feeling is adjust, yeah. adjust. Yes, adjustment indeed. Yeah, it's the time of the pivot. Every, yes, every everybody says, how are you doing? And we're like, well, what, what second are we on right now? Because it's literally changing. <laughs> every every morning I wake up, I'm like, okay, what are we doing today? <laughs> What's going to happen today? It's like afraid to open up the email, right? Right. Like, I dread looking at the paper every morning because it's like, you know, you just never know. You never know what's going on. Um, but, you know, we're surviving and you're getting to see the best of who people are as you do in every tragedy. Uh, but it's, you know, this one weighs on the soul uh, a lot. Yeah. Well, I have to say that I have been watching you and feeling very proud of you. Uh, and so mm -hmm. Joe and I actually, you, you don't know this, but we spent a lot of time strategizing on your career moves. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so we're like, you know, Mar you know what Marquis should be doing right now? Getting ready um, for You know how he should be positioning himself. And then next thing you know, you're, you're putting out some really great work. And so um, it, it takes a lot for me to say that I, I like my politicians. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 trust me. Yeah, it takes a lot for me to like one too. So I can feel you on that. <laughs> okay. So that being said, you are in demand, and I hear you guys are back in um, in uh, starting your meetings next week, right? Yeah. So next week, Wednesday, uh, we're supposed to start back regular council meetings. Um, it uh, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. We'll still only be at two days a week. City Hall is still closed, FYI, to everybody. So there's none of your council members have anybody in their offices. Uh, you're only allowed into the into the building for essential business, uh, which, by the way, one of them is paying your business tax. You can do that right on the first floor, right <laughs> by the door. <laughs> um, they can somehow they, got you. Well, they found a way to keep it open for that. Um, <laughs> everything else in the it's city hall is, <laughs> is shut down, and we'll be doing uh, meetings and committee meetings remotely. So, okay, good. so we've been told by your team you have a very short window today. Um, although we know we'll be able to have many more conversations. Sure. Um, so the goal of today. So I'm gonna try to keep my stories <laughs> to the. I had to, you know, tell, uh, tell Joe. She had to give me a pre-talk. He's not the one being interviewed today. Okay, <laughs> so all those amazing stories, you know, he Got can em. say for when the spotlight is on you. Got they it. all. How about this? Another day, I'll interview you, and you can sit on the other side of the camera. Sounds good. Okay. Um, I'll so, go to the other room on the Zoom. <laughs> so that being said, though, in particular, I think we really wanted to focus on this concept of defunding the police. Right. Um, and then all of the different initiatives and, and work that you've already been doing, um, I know, with a lot of different um, collaborations and collectives in our community. But uh, defunding the police, obviously, is... Um, for, for those of us who grew up, you know, doing civil rights work, community work, it's a concept we've actually talked about quite a bit, you know, so this is not new. Um, however, for a lot of people, it's sort of blowing their mind, um, both either scaring them or exciting them. Uh, you know, there's people trying to say, hell no. There's people trying to say, hell yes. There's people trying to say, let's meet in the middle. Like every issue, you have people all over the board. Um, but like just talking about defunding the police, what does that mean to you and, and from your office sort of how are you guys looking at that concept? Well, you know, from where I'm stationed and I think, you know, it's like we've talked about before. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an activist, you know, I've decided to dedicate my life to the struggle for social and economic justice uh, here, in here in Los Angeles and in the United States. And so at different points in times, you play different positions, right? So that's, true in basketball, that's true in a fire department, that's true in a coffee shop. You're playing different positions. And from the position I'm at now as an elected official, I really have the responsibility of looking at what is the practical, the legal, and the achievable uh, consequence of the movement that's been created in the streets. 
we always know that it starts at the ground level. Any big social movement, any you know, uh, massive social change, significant social change starts at the ground level. And so, the, you know, people in the streets put out the demand that something had to be done about the police, that there ought to be police accountability, and that crescendoed real quickly into people unifying around this call to defund the police. Um, as a practical matter, in the city of LA, most cities. Uh, their biggest departments are their police department. Los Angeles is no different. Uh, this Los Angeles Police Department has more people that work for it. They get a bigger part of the budget, more than half. Uh, and they have more than half the responsibilities uh, of, the, uh, of the cities. And so we look at how, how we can take that and one, create more accountability and really try to accomplish what people are saying. And, I, and what I hear people saying is, why are these armed government workers in every aspect of my life, right? So if there's a homeless encampment at the corner, which people are committing there the crime of being poor or having an addiction or having a mental health uh, condition, uh, which could happen to any of us at any time, we don't have the financial wherewithal, that's where our society puts you, um, to if I have something wrong with my car from a broken tail light to a cracked windshield, um, to it's smoking too much. Um, there are, in all those situations, I'm confronted by a government worker with a gun. It's like, what, what is that about? If I have a car accident, if I have a fender bender with somebody else, here comes eight, nine armed men and women come to, help. to <laughs> take measurements, take pictures, fill out forms, all this kind of stuff. And so what we really are looking at in the city of Los Angeles is how do we reimagine public safety? So how do we use our resources so that the money we invest in public safety strategies actually produces safety? And I'll give you an example of that. And two, we reduce this notion that everything that happens has to be confronted by somebody with a deadly weapon. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, especially since in this society, it's legal for the government to kill you as a citizen if you're not a police, if you're holding a deadly weapon. All you have to do is be holding it, right? And they can come up, they, you know, just the other, uh, a few months ago, they shot a 12 year old child because he had what they thought was a deadly weapon. It turned out to be a toy. Uh, and, that, and that was ruled a legal shooting. So if, if in fact, uh, that's how deadly weapons are confronted in the society, we shouldn't have them respond to very basic things. And so there are three things we're doing on city council. We're looking at a program to, re, a, a program to reassign um, calls about homelessness. Yes. Ideally, we'll reassign them to people who have lived experience with homelessness, that have been trained on how to identify mental health issues, how to identify substance abuse, how to identify resources to help. Again, nobody's saying that homeless encampments should be a way of life. They shouldn't. You shouldn't have to live in one if you don't have any place to live, nor should you have one in the alley behind your house or your business if you're lucky enough to have a house or a business. Neither of those things should happen. So we, but the question becomes, how do we deal with them in the way that makes sense? In the way that makes sense for the first, the people who are the victims of homelessness, and then for those who homelessness is a nuisance and a safety, uh, health and safety hazard. So we, we're looking at creating that force. The second one is mental health. In other cities around the world and in this country, when a person has a mental health call, they can call a mental health worker. And in the old days, you used to be able to do that when we had mental health hospitals. And I'm just learning this as a part of this process. In the old days, if somebody in your household or on your block or around you was having a mental health episode, you could call the local mental health hospital and they had workers there. You remember the men in the white suits? Yeah, yeah. Those fellows in the white suits with yeah. the, and they had the straight jackets. <laughs> they would show up to where this person was and they're unarmed. Uh, they could, they could definitely have a physical interaction, but they were unarmed and they certainly weren't armed with deadly force. Uh, they would deal with that person. They could take them to the hospital. They could do whatever needed to be done uh, in that situation. So we're trying to recreate that. Um, and maybe it's based out of our fire department and paramedics. Maybe it's based on a standalone department, but basically making so 24 hours a day, you can call, and get within minutes somebody to come help you deal with uh, a potentially dangerous mental health person. I don't know how many times I hear in my district people say, hey, you know, there's this guy who lives on my block and he has episodes. I don't want to call the police because I couldn't live with myself if he ends up getting hurt or killed or even incarcerated. But I got to call somebody because 
they're causing a, you know, it's a problem and somebody's going to get hurt and there's nobody for me to call. Um, and so we want to fix that. And then the last one and the big one, the one I'm, I'm taking principal responsibility for, along with some of my colleagues, is the one on transportation. Traffic stops do not have to be done by police officers, and we're arguing that they should not be done by police officers. Transportation safety is the responsibility of the Department of Transportation in the city of Los Angeles. So transportation workers can give traffic citations if you need be. There's a question of if traffic citations even work first of all. So we want to deal with that question first. Um, you know, if you have a broken tail light, right, or your brake lights don't work, in some countries in the world, you get pulled over by a traffic inspector, and that traffic inspector asks, asks you to wait 20 minutes, and they go in the back of their truck, and they fix your light. Wow. And you get a bill in the mail for it, and that's the end of it. What a concept. Right, because if, if me not having a brake light is really a traffic problem right. and compromises safety Somehow giving me a ticket it. doesn't fix that it doesn't do anything because i still got to go where i got to go until i get it fixed um so so there are a number of things like that also with dui we saw the brother get shot in the back uh in atlanta for dui for which when the police got there he was parked right right and he, he was not drunk <laughs> right he was like i'll walk home i'll walk home that's why i parked so i could sleep it off right in in canada uh, when you get a DUI, the police may pull you over, but they call someone else. And that person, if they feel like you're a risk and you might drive again, they put a boot on your car. You know, they put a boot on your car. Yeah. When you have to, yeah. They put a boot on your car and they call you a cab. Easy. Done. Wow. What a wild and idea. It's your car back. You got to deal with the, you know, you got to deal with the situation, yeah. but it's, it's over. There's no putting anybody in jail, which is a waste. There's no tasing people and getting in wrestling matches and all kinds of nonsense uh, that we have here. We think we can do that. Those traffic, you know, when there's a traffic accident, those don't need to please be police officers. People in our community like can get that, you know, take pictures, measure, fill out forms. Our people can do that job. And, you know, that could be a good union job that folks go, um, uh, that folks have a career with and it won't take 90 minutes for somebody to get there. Uh, if we aren't relying on police. So those are just some of the things we can do. And I'll end with this as an example about safety. So the city of LA has almost 400 traffic enforcement officers that are police officers. They have about 600 motorcycles and, and uh, hundreds of radar guns. Now, anybody who lives in South LA will know this. All my life, this has been the case. On Slauson between Overhill and Crenshaw has been a speed trap my entire life. There's been the guy on the motorcycle. I mean, yeah. I'm sure people have come and gone, retired. People still speed. Yes. So if after all this time, it doesn't change behavior, maybe you need to do something different. Uh, and instead of us, you know, paying a guy to be out there, then giving people traffic tickets, then going to court, you know, it's just kind of a ring around the rosy, a way of taking money away from people, really. Uh, and, and, you know, one of these inefficient jobs programs. Uh, let's figure, if we really want people to slow down on Slauson, let's figure out a way to get them to do that. If we don't, let's leave people the hell alone and stop shooting them with radar guns. Uh, so our bill seeks to look at all of that and really pull back the incursion of police officers in our day-to-day -day lives that don't involve, involve the need for, for deadly weapons and coercion. Well, you, you damn near covered everything there, but I, I know- Knocked Joe, out my two questions. Yeah, right? Joe and I, in particular, the last um, issue that you were covering about taking the police out of traffic stops, I know was something that really hit home for us. Your video on Instagram was so moving. Right. And I know you had your own personal experience with this also. Many times. I mean, you know, it, it really it really hit home with me, you know, knowing, well, you know, I, I know this because it's happened to me. But when you said it, I just, it, it just, I don't know, uh, um, puts the, puts it more, more real, you know, that it really does happen to all of us. And it just, it, it's, it's really no, it, there's no real explanation for it. Um, I, it, it happened so recently to me as two days ago. You know, because I'm in an Audi gave us a car to drive and I didn't get pulled over, but I got a police car stopped behind me 
And you know, you're, 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 my, my heart starts racing. I'm going, what the heck's going on? And then he asks me, or he says to me, man, that's a nice car. Really? <laughs> I mean, I know that's nice and everything, but you got to understand, you got to know what you're doing to a brother in a, in a nice car. You know what I mean? So, For all the other times that you were driving a nice car and did get pulled and did over get pulled and over. got taken out of the car and got your, you know, your car, uh, what is it called, searched. And like mm -hmm. you said, guns put to the head. It know, just all brings it back. Stuff. It's like that PTSD, like you said, the driving wall black, like just being able to get rid of that I, I tell people all the time, I'm a white woman, but, you know, because I've grown up in the black community and I've, I've heard the stories and I've witnessed it myself that I now, when I drive, I feel scared to death when I drive and a cop comes behind me and I'm thinking I'm carrying this level of privilege that many other people in my community don't. But if I feel this scared to death, you know, imagine how traumatizing it is and it's rooted in, in truth. And I think that so many people don't necessarily have that experience, firsthand experience. So they hear the stories and they think like, oh yeah, that happens sometimes. And right. it's like, no, that is literally the, like when you said you've had a gun pointed at your head five times and four of those have been during traffic stops. I just, again, that's what I'm saying. It makes me really proud to have you as our representative because I feel like- That was real, man. You know, you really are telling the truth. And that's what people need to hear. And I'm, I'm imagining for you right now, um, you know, I, I know that our city council is relatively diverse, but I'm just curious of what it feels like to be in the position you're in right now in a time in history where, um, you know, racial inequality is like the hot topic, you know, yeah. and Black Lives Matter is the hot topic and, you know, performative allyship as we like to say, is like just everywhere. So everybody's saying, I stand with Black Lives Matter. I'm down yeah. with the Black Lives yeah. Matter party, you know, whatever. That, it's, though, it's, getting it's, back to me, that's why I let her drive. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, no, I trust me. Yeah, it's yeah. Sad, sad, but that's that's the truth of it. But. And get a cab and all the rest of it when yeah. that was, you had to do that. Um, you know, it's I really appreciate the last question, Celia, because it's, you know, I was telling people the other day that when I made the decision to run for office, you know, it was a bit of a sacrifice because you, you know, you definitely give up some things. Um, but at the same time, I knew I couldn't stand on the sidelines and complain about what people were doing if I was unwilling to get in there and do it myself. But I thought the most I was going to be able to do is, you know, help get some of our streets cleaner, you know, help good people start businesses in the community, you know, help get some healthy food in the community all of which are very, very important things. And, you know, things like Destination Crenshaw, I thought I'd be able to do. But the idea that we'd really be able to take a bite out of this most pressing, most dangerous, uh, uh, most enduring form of oppression, you know, it just, it's beyond my wildest uh, dreams. I never dreamed I'd be in office and, you know, I'd walk out the, hall, the steps of City Hall and I'd see a bunch of white people screaming Black Lives Matter. Like, I just never... Never imagined I just, that. You know, I'm like, if I had dreamed that, I would have said, what did you drink last night? Because I, <laughs> uh, um, I, you know, it's just so beyond what I thought was possible uh, in our time, in our lifetime. And so it's very, very exciting. And so, you know, we just try to get up every day and make sure we deliver on the moment. Uh, and so, you know, we can say to our ancestors and we can say to our descendants that, you know, when the bell rang, you know, we showed up. Uh, you know, and when, when they called action, I knew my lines right. and, uh, and I hit them, I hit my lines and I hit my spot. So good. Well, and on Thank that you. note, I think that you and I should give up or we should all, but you and I particular being rooted out of community coalition and strategy center should give up some love to our, um, you know, Oregon community organizations that took a 35% bite out of the school police budget which yeah. I'm not sure everybody knows and have, have heard about the amazing work that Community Coalition, Strategy Center, BLM LA, Cadre Parents, Youth Justice LA, and even others. It was a whole coalition effort. Um, but that's been a project people have been working on for 20, 30 years, yeah, trying to get the police out of LAUSD. And because of the time and the moment and the, move, you know, the movement that happened, the pressure was put on and they were able to get a 35% budget cut of police in the schools. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that? That is uh, very exciting and very gratifying. You know, getting something done in a short amount of time on the LAUSD school board is, 
extremely difficult is the way I'll put it. I spent a good part of my career trying to do that, whether it's working on suspensions and expulsions, working on college prep courses, working on funding, making sure the, the resources went to the kids who needed it the most. It's very difficult. So in the space of a week, they got that done. Uh, and those activists got factions on the school board to work together that don't even speak to each other, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, it shows you the force that, that folks can bring. But the idea, you know, it's one of those things how activism can change everything. So now you had a situation. I, I remember three years ago, I was, well, three years ago, probably more like seven years ago, because I wasn't on the council yet. And the superintendent, who was basic, who was pretty much an ally, he had helped us on school suspensions and expulsions. He had helped us on a number of justice issues, the funding. When I said to him, why don't you cut the police? He laughed at me. He said, oh, you got to be kidding me. Are you, are you crazy? Like, you see what happens on these campuses? Are, are you, you know? And so, you know, you're kind of stuck there, right? To fast forward, when they're scrambling to say, well, we don't use deadly weapons, we only use mace. Oh, oh really, you only use mace on children? Really? Like, really? <laughs> um, so it just, you know, we always had the saying in, in, in organizing, when you find out uh, the underside of these systems, and you have people that you could move to your side or who are on your side in place, the main thing you wanna do is force a public discussion. Because if they have to say in public, oh, we only use mace on kids, we don't use, we don't use tasers, people go, are you out of your mind? <laughs> um, and uh, you know, just like they had to say, oh yeah, like uh, you know, we, sus we don't start suspending them until they get into kindergarten. We don't right. suspend in, right. in preschool. When they had to say that out loud, right. then everybody was like, what, what are you doing, right? Um, and they, the activists forced that. They forced it in a short amount of time and they got that. You know, I think, uh, you know, policing as we know it, uh, which traces, traces its legacy back to slavery. Um, again, remember this whole, we talk about driving while black in a casual way, like, like, like it's a new thing. Driving while black is how they enforce slavery. If you were a black person and you weren't tied to a white slave owner, anybody could pull you over and make you prove that you weren't a slave. And if you didn't, they could either kill you or they could take you and deliver you back to a slave. That's the same thing driving while black is. Yes. You're driving around in a nice car. You're black. I can stop you and make you prove that it's really your car and that you really own it. That's what's happening here. Same thing with school police. You come into school. I don't like the way you look. I can stop you and incarcerate you and make you prove that you are in fact a legitimate student, even though you're a teenager and you're the age of everybody that goes to school. And so we're seeing that go away and, and folks are chipping at it and chipping at it and chipping at it. And you know, it's a qualitative moment. So big, big props to Students Deserve, Community Coalition, BLM, Labor Strategy Center, Cadre. So many people have been working on this so many years and uh, I was happy to see them get a moment and get a victory. Absolutely. And I do just want to say, I think they were going for 35%, but they got 25. So I was, I yeah. think 35, I'm, I'm looking yeah. at it. We're going for a hundred percent. That's, that's just, right. that's, no, that's 25 right. is a down payment. That's yes. right. I love it. Down in a house. So that's what we're putting down on, on getting rid of the school police, which is oxymoronic. The idea that we even have school police. Right. Absolutely. And just to say, it's I designed say, that way. You guys understand the whole thing or you, I know you do, but it's, design that's where you start training them to stay in jail yeah. right you train you train people to institutionalize and meanwhile the police have you know they got mace they got handcuffs they got bullhorns they got all their equipment and our teachers are you know raising money to go down to the costco to get school supplies it's you know something's not right i mean it's so good that we're having this conversation and i'm mindful of the time because we can just keep chatting it up but i do want oh, to, because of the moment that we're in obviously we have these two um uh, many, but two very particular issues going on in the world, but in our community in particular, right? We have this conversation around, finally, um, conversation around equity and racial justice, economic justice, food justice, all these great things. And then we have, obviously, in the backdrop of um, COVID-19, uh, and again, it brings up the conversation around racial justice and inequality um, and, and sort of systemic inequality. So I, it, it is not doing it justice enough um, to just steal a few last minutes of your time, but can we touch upon um, COVID-19 in particular in relationship to South Central, South LA? Um, you know, what's going on right now to prevent the spread? You know, what can we be doing 
uh, more of, better of in our community. And, and I know there's also a, a huge other topic around the black housing crisis and how COVID is impacting that. Well, you know, the housing crisis is something we need to be talking about because that's going to come up on us so fast and swift. Uh, you know, our city council, you know, I think people did the most they could politically. Uh, but really what we did was a landlord assistance program. Uh, which doesn't solve the problem at all. I, I don't think any, in fairness, I don't think any of us anticipated we'd be back at a potential shutdown in July. I think most of us thought late May, early June, we'd be kind of back to normal. Um, so, you know, I, again, I think it's, it's very, very rough. The thing that you all have done, and I think doing more of it is great, and you, to me, as many people as you can get to do it, the better. Normalizing wearing masks, wearing gloves, being conscious of it, because it's so easy for our people who are worried, who are in survival mode, to just forget that that's even there as a thing. You know, people who even believe in masks, I don't know how many times, you know, I've left my house without a mask or other people leave right. their house without masks. I've come to your events and I was like, oh, I forgot my mask. And luckily you guys have had masks. <laughs> um, so I think keeping it in the consciousness of everybody with everything that's going on is, is very, very important. Uh, demonstrating, modeling the behavior as well, uh, and making it a community norm that we're going to fight through this together and, and, and really creating a campaign environment around it, I think is, is ideal. Because that's the only thing that's going to stop this thing. The right. federal government is not going to help us, uh, especially now that they see that the people that are dying from it are black and brown right. and Pacific Islander. That, you know, they're not going to uh, really, really try to stop it. Um, so, so we've got to do, uh, do that as well. We're doing testing, so we encourage people to get as tested as often as they can, again, to normalize. The way getting an HIV test is now normal, uh, you, everybody on this call, we're old enough to remember when HIV was new. And, you know, it's like, well, no, that's for them. Like, I don't do yeah, that. Right. And, and now it's you get an HIV test as a normal sort of course of business. We really need to take, make the COVID testing that way as well, um, because most of the public experts agree about 50 percent of the population will get it before it's over, they will contract it. They may not get sick, but they will contract it. We're now at about 11%. Oh. So, so we got a ways to go. Uh, so people need to get tested. People need to learn how to, you know, people, if you haven't had it, you need to have a plan for how you were quarantined, mm -hmm. right? It's, we don't have the excuse like we did when it started. Well, I'm, I need to quarantine and I live with my grandmother and I live with my kids. And, right. you know, now you, you have time to say like, okay, if one of us has to quarantine, this is how it's going to go. Call your neighbor, you know, work something out, call your neighbors. We, I have some constituents who, um, working with their local church, some men from the church came in and built up a little wall, you know, in a, in a certain section of the house so the person could kind of stay in there and when they they don't go out until everybody else leaves. So work out a, work out a quarantine plan now uh, in case you have to quarantine, anticipate you will have to quarantine. Uh, and then, you know, most importantly, look out for your neighbors. Uh, that, you know, that's an easy one to do. Uh, there are a lot of people in our community that don't have someone looking in on them, as, as we all know. Really important now to look on them, in on them and make sure they're okay. God, there's so many things that he's bringing up that I want to talk further about. Is I there wanna, any, any I want to talk about that. that. I want to talk about that. You know, we, we are trying, or when we give out our 150 grocery bags every week, we are trying to supply the community with masks also. Uh, we're doing, I mean, there, oh, no, we are we're, 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 we're There's putting masks them in, in there. Yeah, so um, we're doing everything we can. Yeah, and if you oh, don't this, have a mask, come to South LA Cafe. We got a mask we'll for you. We'll give you a mask. Um, right. We're, we're, right. Something no. that we're seen as a community institution and cultural hub where people are looking to us. They know people come here, and so they're giving us masks so that we can give to the community. So if you're watching this, you don't have masks, please come to us. We'll take care of you. We don't let anybody come in the door without a mask. <laughs> so we'll know right just away. Just at the door, we'll that, come out. That you need some masks. Um, just as we wrap it up, um, Marquise, I'm just wondering, because, you know, again, sort of the activist organizer background, you never leave people without a call to action. So, you know, what can people do to get behind, in particular, this initiative? I mean, I think it is, you know, so simple yet revolutionary of getting the police off the, the streets on the traffic stop. So is there something in particular that people can do to support with that or any of the other initiatives that we've already talked about today? We, we, we will let you know. We're going to be having very large community hearings. We want people to come to those hearings, whether they're on Zoom or they're on per, in person. We want people to come to those hearings and we want people to tell their stories. The simple ones like I was driving an Audi and somebody started following me. 
<laughs> to the to the more traumatic ones, right? Because you know, one of the things that's real about this issue, and I think Joe, you kind of point to it, the, the history is so horrific and so rife with terror that nothing bad actually has to happen for you to be traumatized. Right. All the guy said was nice car. Nice car. Like, you know what I mean? I'm traumatized hearing it because I know how you felt at that moment. <laughs> um, but but people the, the 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 people in the community that don't understand that need to understand that uh, because we need their support in moving us away from the reliance on policing that we have. Um, you know, there's still far too many elements of our community that are scared. And what happens is my colleagues think that those people are still there. They're just being silent right now. They do. They believe people that, you know, they believe, oh, you know, no one really believes in this defund the police stuff. Right. And I get that, but I don't agree with them. I think that when I go to people that should be against this, you know, they all feel like, yeah, well, we spend a lot on police and it's not really clear what we get for it. Uh, and at least there ought to be an examination of that. But in order to keep that conversation in the fore, I think that's going to be done through through just storytelling, sharing. Uh, and we're going to be asking folks to do that, not only storytell show, but also tell them what best practices are. Um, and so that, you know, again, I just everybody's got to understand the weight of what's before us, which I think you all do. Uh, and, and treat it accordingly. So look out for us. We'll be making announcements about hearings. They'll start in August. They'll probably go uh, past Labor Day uh, and the council will start deliberating on options then. Sounds good. And if you're hearing background noise, it's because our audio visual guys decided to come in right in the middle of our interview. So our we IT. make sure that we have really great uh, connection. Uh, the I last might be asking you to send them my way, so. Yeah, there you go. The yeah, last thing I just want to ask is if people want to get um, COVID testing in our area, Where is should there they a go? website to check out? Follow, they go to your follow, site? Follow us on Instagram. We have some type of testing every week. Uh, and there's the ongoing testing at Crenshaw Christian Center in the community. Also, if you have, if you've been in contact with somebody or you have any symptoms, you can go to any St. John's clinic. And they're all over the place. Hyde Park, Lamert Park. Uh, Manchester, Broadway, uh, Hoover, and Slauson. They're all over the place. You can go in any one of those. You'll, you can see a doctor right away and they'll give you a test there as well. But that's only for people who have actual symptoms or I was in the car with somebody and it turned out that they have COVID, that kind of thing. Other than that, if you just want to be tested, we give events usually on weekends uh, and we announce those on Instagram. Awesome. And so anybody who's watching this um, or sees it on YouTube or on our IGTV or on our newsletter, we'll make sure to include those links also where they can find you. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for fighting the good fight. You know that we've got your back here. Um, 100%. And grateful to be in this together and keep going and doing that good work. So we'll talk to you. Thank soon. you all so much. It's such good energy that comes out of that place. You all are a beacon in, in, in the heart of South LA. So we appreciate you. Uh, everything that you have been and everything that you will be for the community. And, and uh, that, you know, we, we all feel like we own that coffee shop. Uh, <laughs> well, we're just scratching the surface. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, sure. There are going to be many That's more things that people can feel like they're, they're part of owning. Right. Well. right. It's, it's community owned and you all are the caretakers. And so we, we really <laughs> appreciate you for, for uh, bringing that vision to us. Thank you. All Thank right. you. You're one, of, you're one of the good ones, man. You know that. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. All right, you guys be good. Bye. Be well. Bye-bye.